Welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Nicole Jackson. I'm one of the co-organizers for Black and Environment Week. Um, today is day four of Black and Environment Week, Black to School, and we're focusing on environmental education. I'm super excited to be here with our panelists and my co-moderator, uh, Patricia Wilson. Uh, so I am viewing from, or sorry, I will be co-moderating from uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, feel free to share where you're viewing from in the chat. Uh, be wonderful to see where everybody is and happy to see you as you're coming in. Hopefully I see uh, most of your faces um, if you're wanting to have your video on. Um, so since today is uh, Black to School, um, the, the topic is Black to School, we're going to focus on environmental education and we have some wonderful panelists here that we're going to introduce. Um, but first, I want to thank um, our sponsors. So in terms of people who are continuously uh, supporting us um, and providing us uh, funding to do this event week, uh, we are so grateful um, on behalf of uh, Black and Environment. And I would like to thank uh, first the Environmental Defense Fund as well as the Natural Resources um, Defense Council. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Jessica Hernandez, um, an environmental scientist um, who has donated her book, uh, Fresh Banana Leaves, for us um, to uh, raffle off at the end of this week. So at the end of this discussion, we will have, um, we will be collecting feedback and you will be entered into the drawing uh, for, to receive one of those books. So thank you so much for tuning in. And we're gonna get started with uh, the beginning portion, which is the introductions for our panelists. So I will move it or put it over uh, for the introduction from Patricia to get us started um, on our intros. Awesome, hello, my name is Patricia. I'm calling in from Peterborough, Ontario in Canada. And I'm excited to introduce some of our panelists today. So um, we have Ashia Ajani, um, and they are a Black queer uh, environmental storyteller and educator hailing from Denver, Colorado, Queen City of the Plains, and unceded territory of the, the Cheyenne, the Ute, the Air, oh, I'm so sorry, the, and Comanche people. Ashia is a plant mama and a sustainable chef. They are an environmental and climate justice educator with Mycelium Youth Network, an Oakland-based climate resilience organization dedicated to educating Bay Area youth of color on place-based adaptive and mitigative strategies for climate change. They have eight years of experience teaching youth in both workshops and classroom settings, as well as outdoor summer programming. Um, they are a Pushcart Prize nominated poet and a writer with words in the Atmos, Atmos At Magazine, Sierra Magazine, Frontier Poetry and World Literature Today, amongst others. Um, they've also received their Masters of Environmental Management from Yale School of Environment in 2020, 2021. And they debut poetry collection Heirloom is forthcoming um, in spring of 2023. Um, so that's a little bit about Ashia, and and then we have uh, Diamond. Diamond um, it, um, throughout their career as an environmental scientist, they have dog sled through snowy forests, rescued and released snow, uh, sea turtles, trained as an aquar um, aquarist, backpacked through remote wilderness, and lived in a van while road tripping across the American Southwest. And that's obviously not even half of it. Uh, Diamond Does represents um, her collection of stories at the intersection of adventure and science. Her goal is to create content that inspires more black and brown uh, people to explore nature and to shed light on the most pressing, pressing issues affected, affecting the health of their planet. So uh, those are our first two panelists that we have here over to Nicole. Thank you so much, Patricia, for going over those intros. For the first two panelists, I will continue with Alicia Eddington, Ellington. Uh, Alicia is a queer biracial woman of color from the Bay Area and the unceded lands of alone peoples. Growing up in the urban city of San Jose, California, she had firsthandedly experienced the power that outdoor environmental education had on a child's learning, which has inspired her career and path, sorry, her career path in academic research. Alicia is currently a PhD student in the sociology department at UC Santa Cruz, where she hopes to center her work on environmental justice, education for youth of color. 
She has worked with youth for over 11 years, holding such roles as naturalist with YMCA, Camp Campbell, and an, Air, an, an AmeriCorps Environmental Literacy Fellow with the San Mateo County Office of Education. She was part of the Environmental Fellows Program through Yale School of, Envi of the Environment during the summer of 2021, where she worked alongside We the People of Detroit, a local community organization to support their youth participatory action research project on lead contaminated water and water shutoffs in Detroit, Michigan. Alicia holds a BS in environmental studies from San Francisco State University. She also received her master of science in environmental studies from San Jose State University, where her qualitative thesis work was centered on analyzing and place-based learning, analyzing place-based learning equitable access and COVID-19 impacts on several outdoor environmental education programs in the Bay Area through the perspectives of community educators. Thank you for being here. And our fourth and final panelist, Dr. Cheryl Tuluxine, Tuluxine, sorry, Tuluxine, uh, is a full, prof full professor and department chair in the sociology department and a member of the Yates, Yates uh, School of Graduate Studies at Ryerson University. Her numerous publications and funded research projects over the last 20 years have focused on examining the relationship between environmental justice in Canada and concerns for social inequality in the urban context. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Tuluxin. All right, so as you're coming in, thank you all for coming. It's good to see people's faces, yay. Please uh, let us know where you're viewing from in the chat. It would be great to see where everyone is, is tuning in from. So we're gonna get started with our first question just to get to know a little bit more about you all uh, and your backgrounds and kind of just what your thoughts are um, about being environmentalists. So the first question that I'd like to ask for everyone um, is what does stewardship mean to you as a black environmentalist? And I'm gonna start with Diamond. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be here. Stewardship to me is a process with the end goal being caretaking of the land, caretaking of its resources. But it starts with having curiosity about nature. And then it goes to um, wanting to connect with nature and, and developing your own environmental ethic. And then it goes to having, you know, your own literacy. And then it goes to caretaking. And I think that process and all the steps that it takes to be a steward can't be an educator. My goal is to help my students, my trainees through that process of being stewards and making sure we're not skipping steps because we're on this planet for the long haul. And if you're, if you're doing this type of work, it needs to be grounded in something that's really personal to you so that you have your why to keep going when it seems like things are hitting the fan and it's not getting better. Thank you so much for that. This is, oh my goodness, we're already starting with like gems. I'm sorry, my brain is like, yay. Uh, I feel like I'm drinking a glass of water um, from a desert walk. So thank you so much. This is awesome. Um, next I'll have, uh, sorry, my screen just, can you all still hear me and see me? Sorry, my screen was glitching a little bit. Yes. Um, Alicia, we'll go, uh, have you go next. Uh, hi everyone. So kind of going off of what Dim Diamond said, I think obviously like the literal definition of stewardship is taking care of something. So going beyond taking care of, say, a community park or a community garden, but kind of what is missing from oftentimes environmental science education is the kind of concept of connectedness and how you connect people to place. And taking care of a garden is meaningful, but how and what is the history behind the actual place and having making sure that you are incorporating everyone's history and knowledge within that element of place and that's what it means to me and also a kind of a form of resistance as well too like you're taking care of something but going beyond like the traditional ideologies of taking care of something 
Beautiful, beautiful. I love that incorporation of sense of place and understanding where you are and that story behind it. I love that. Next, we'll have Dr. Telexine go. You can just call me Cheryl. It might be <laughs> less cumbersome with that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, similar to the other speakers, I, I definitely have a strong connection to land and um, but I realize as well, um, as Black people, because of our histories of colonialism and slavery, there has been a, a particular sort of separation from, from land. So I feel to a certain extent what um, we're able to do and what we're um, doing in this, this panel as well as sort of all talking about how we've um, re-engaged with land on our own terms based on our own social relations because that's the part of it that I often sort of think about when I think about things like agriculture or you know having a garden for me it's not just a garden it's it's tied to histories where gardening um, was something that was kind of like forced on us and, and meant something different even if it's not directly our, our own um, direct ancestors. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Oh, this is, I wish I could like mentally just start taking notes as you're saying things. It's recorded, so I can definitely go back and watch it. Uh, but this is, I, I'm, I'm loving all of this. All right. So our last uh, panelist, would you like to go? And then we can move on to our, our next question. Yeah, um, I think similar to the other panelists and especially kind of like going off of what uh, Cheryl said, I know, especially when I was younger, I didn't really have any, even though, you know, like I grew up in Denver, Colorado, which a lot of people think is a very, you know, like kind of like urban nature, sort of perfect kind of harmony place. Um, I didn't really have much or didn't really feel much of a connection to place, I think, because there was something inside me that recognized the history of America and the history of removal, and particularly of estrangement um, for Black people in particular, um, how we often we were forced to move and not really kind of like engage or, you know, set roots in a place because at any point, especially, you know, during like Great Migration, during um, the riots, like you, you might have to go at any point. So it's hard to kind of like make a place-based connection when you're constantly on the move and you're constantly running. Um, and so I think that was kind of hard for me, you know, like at, when I was younger to really think about what would direct engagement or what would feeling responsible to a place look like. Um, and as I got older and as I got a little bit more in tune with my history and realized it's not just this history of flight and removal, but it's like this history of resistance, of marooning, of, you know, like getting to know the land um, in order to, you know, like facilitate flight or to facilitate um, being hidden. Um, I love kind of these, these narratives of of like stealth that we employed. Um, and that was like some way that we got to steward and, and felt responsible to the land and felt the land take care of us. And I mean, on the flip side, um, the land, even though it wasn't like the land's fault, um, it was weaponized against us in such a way that like didn't really like engage um, or provide room for engagement um, uh, in a way that felt like a responsibility or stewardship. So to me, like, you know, like stewardship really is a lot of healing, um, especially for younger people, for um, youth who don't have as much um, proximity to nature, um, who grew up in kind of like concrete jungles like I did. Um, it's how do we even see nature in those spaces too? And how do we feel responsible to areas that might not be um, immediately recognizable as like environmental or nature-based? Yes, um, I agree. Like the definitions alone of, and the terminology that we use, I feel like really impacts the work that we do as environmental educators. And um, again, going back to the sense of place and the storytelling um, being a big part of that beyond the, the quantitative and um, uh, science um, that is often referred to uh, within environmental education. Thank you so much for that. All right, so we'll have Patricia move on to the, the next question for us. 
So I just wanted to take a moment um, and um, just hear from our panelists just a little bit about about yourself and like what you do um, right now, just to provide some context for everyone who's joined us today. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll move on to the next question. So I know we did a really very brief bio, but I just want to hear what you're doing right now. What 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 what's what's the field that you're in? What What's your job and what do you love about it? So we will start with Cheryl. Okay, I'm a, a professor of sociology and the chair of, of my department at um, uh, a university that was called Ryerson University, and we're now actually calling it X University, and um, mainly because we're questioning the university's ties to the land and the colonial relations. And um, I have been doing environmental justice work for um, quite a while, and um, as part of that work, which actually sort of happened out of serendipity, I literally was in the library and fell into a book by Robert Bullard, um, who is considered by a lot of Americans as being sort of the, uh, the father of the environmental justice movement. And um, based on that, I started to ask all sorts of questions about what does this mean for um, uh, Blacks and racialized people in Canada. Um, uh, how does somebody go about as an academic um, demonstrating that environmental racism exists? And are there organizations? So a lot of my work has been, um, and I consider myself really fortunate to be doing this, is to be providing um, evidence for a lot of community groups um, to sort of lend um, support to the sorts of things that they think are sort of important and that they already know based on their understandings of their bodies. And, um, and yeah, so that's sort of how that has sort of been the catalyst for my work. And I never get tired of it. And the environment or the racialized uh, side in terms of racialized problems are constantly changing and evolving. So there is always so much work to do. So in this sense, it's 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 great to see that there are so many other people here who are interested in the same the same issue. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. And I've been following that um, the name change. So I'm excited to hear what they finally rename um, the university because that's that'll be really interesting. Um, okay, Diamond, you next, please. Sure. Hi, everybody. I am an environmental educator. I fell into the role right after college and um, struggled with being an environmental educator in white institutions for a while until I hit such a breaking point that I quit my job on my birthday two years ago, started a community engagement program called Black by Nature with the mission to elevate Black joy and environmental literacy in Baltimore City. We had our first program season last year. And I'm also an adventure traveler. So I'm on a bit of a soul medical at the moment. I've been living in Mexico for the past three months. And so I'm bringing to this conversation, like my perspective of being, you know, in these organizations, trying my best to push the Jedi initiative and hitting walls at every turn and then finally giving up and starting my own thing and finding so much joy in it joy in it to now being in a space where taking care of myself is priority in order to pour back into my community and give them the skills and the energy and experience that I feel that we need as Black people in order to be resilient in, in, this, in this space, in the U.S. in particular, and having, like, being in Mexico has given me a lot of perspective about what that means. So, that's who I am at the moment and how I am getting at my storytelling and, and still engaging and educating while I'm away is through making content. So that's what I'm right now. I'm very untraditional at the moment. I love that. That's amazing. And I like <laughs> I like the word solvatical. That's fantastic. I wish I could take one right now. <laughs> uh, over to you, Alicia. 
So for me, I am currently a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz in the sociology department. And I would say um, my academic journey has definitely been kind of on a roller coaster of rides. And so I started off in environmental studies with like a focus on natural science. I was like all about flora, fauna, trees and everything. And I was like, cool, I really love this, but it's really hard to kind of remember all these like plant identifications. And so I took time off and kind of did like the non-traditional route where it's going straight into grad school and did fellowships connected with people through environmental education and kind of teaching about conservation. And I really enjoyed talking to people. And I was like, maybe I still like environment, but how do I do that in the social aspect of it? And so like for many years taught gymnastics and loved working with kids and got my training in environmental science. And I'm like, I like these two aspects. How do I put them together? And went back into grad school and actually did environmental studies, but focused more on the natural or the social science part of it and learning about um, environmental justice and learning through other scholars. And that was like the first time I actually was connected to like black scholars in environmental science and was reading Dr. Darcita Taylor's work and learning about like um, like Harriet Tubman working on the Underground Railroad, but never kind of making those connections between Black resistance in an environmental lens, which was mind blowing to me. And I actually felt seen for the first time reading her work. Um, but currently right now, taking classes, learning in sociology and like putting the two, I guess, refining more of my training within the social social side of it and kind of getting that training in a different discipline to make me a better scholar. And so I can be more well-rounded and interdisciplinary. So a lot of learning, um, but that's currently what I'm up to taking a lot of classes. Amazing, amazing. Learning and educating at the same time, you know, it's 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 a balance and that's fantastic that you're doing that. Um, all right, uh, Ashia, we'll go over to you. Yeah, I also had kind of like a non, uh, traditional path in that like I'm very I'm, I'm, I'm interested in everything um if something like grasps my interest I I'm like that person that wants to do a deep dive into it for like months and months and months until I get tired of it um and so I kind of like did that throughout my journey um and throughout my academic journey throughout my literary journey as well when I first entered college actually um I was thinking about doing chemical engineering because I was really interested in renewable energy um and was going to kind of take that hard science path um, and I'm not saying that this is the case for, you know, like all chemical engineering, but at my institution, it seemed to be much more focused, not so much on renewable energy, but um, it looked like it was going to be, I would be working for like a gas company, I would be working for a petroleum, and, and I just, I, that was just not what I wanted to do. And I'd always loved science, um, I'd always loved literature. So environmental studies kind of seemed like a cool nexus point. I could do a lot of really cool like ecology stuff, but I could also do like that kind of social side um, that Alicia was talking about. Um, so I did environmental studies as an undergrad. My focus was in environmental justice and food rights. I took a class with, um, she's a professor at Lawrence University now, um, Sigma Colon, um, environmental inequalities. And it was just like every, like it was just the intersection of everything that I was passionate about. I did a lot of organizing work in high school. Um, I did a lot of stuff around racial justice, um, looking specifically, you know, Denver is a place that was kind of on that first huge wave of urban renewal and gentrification. And to me, those are environmental issues um, and spatial issues as well. And so really wanted to see how I could combine ecology, social justice and writing all into one. And now here I am at my Cilium Youth Network as like a storyteller, as an educator. Um, I've always loved working with youth. Um, they have like some of the best ideas about how to solve issues. Um, they think, I think they don't limit themselves, you know, in a way that I think sometimes adults um, do and that's like really inspiring for me as well um, because sometimes I can catch myself limiting my thinking and then I go and talk to my students and it's like oh I don't even have to limit my thinking like that like and it's just it's very renewing um, and then you know on the literary side uh, just wanting to write a lot more about black environmental issues because um, it feels like there's so much of a in academic spaces and of course I feel like it's getting a lot better over the past few years but it feels like there's such a split between, um, you know, like black issues and environmental issues. And I remember even when I was an undergrad, 
if I wanted to take like those intersectional classes, I'd have to go to the ethnic studies department. Like that wasn't really incorporated in the environmental department, even though these were directly like, you know, like environmental issues. And I'm of the opinion, and you know, this might be generalizing, that everything is an environmental issue. Um, if you really kind of like break it down because we are our environment, you know, and our environment reflects so much on us. Um, and so that kind of, you know, that intersection was really valuable to me and kind of brought me to where I am today. Amazing. Yeah, you touched on a lot of really great points there. There is a huge disconnect. And um, yeah, we don't often learn about, um, you know, injustices that face more racialized communities. And, you know, um, environmental justice in general is is very much so taught through a white lens. And I definitely found that in within my academic career. So my question to you guys all, because you're all we have a mix of educators and um, you know learners and storytellers in this group. So, in your opinion, how can we make space in the curriculum or in how we teach um, to discuss environmental injustices in the classroom um, to make sure that the black voices are being heard um, and the black experiences are being heard in the classroom and, and learning about these histories that you know some of us are just learning now, right? Um, so, how, how can we kind of do this in the classroom. So who wants to take a crack at that question first? Or I can I can I'll I can choose. I can choose. Um I um John, go ahead. Sure. So I read a book a couple of years ago called Where the Water Goes, and the name is escaping me at the, uh, the author is escaping me at the moment, but it's about the Colorado River and how um land land uh, water water rights in the west and uh, just how crazy they, they are and i developed this spe framework and that you can break down an environmental issue by its social political and economic context and by starting by like looking at the industries at play the policies and practices that support those industries and then looking at who the people and where they are and, and how they're being affected you can start looking at environmental issues in this more holistic context and get in at depth of why why this is happening you know water flooding in baltimore city isn't just an environmental issue it's a social justice issue because of these policies and because of these industries and it's affecting these people that have been redlined in these places and so i think by you know and this is a, a, a framework that I use for a high school after school program. And it really helped us in like dissecting the an environmental issue by talking about, you know, all the things that play into why this is happening and not just, you know, there's flooding. So that's, that's one way that I've attempted to introduce environmental justice into the classroom. Awesome, awesome. Anyone else? Cheryl, Canadian perspective? Yeah, I, I think it's this, the same same way in, in the U.S., but in, in Canada, we're increasingly um, aware of the fact that we're all settlers, right? So including um, Black folks. And I think if we back up and think about it in, in that sense, that makes land um, and natural resource extraction, which is a big, big part of at least Canada's economic success, um, it makes environmental um, injustices part of you know how the country was 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 founded and so much of where our, our identity is, and everybody else has to sort of fall in line in 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 keeping with that. Um, I in in the curriculum then you know as Diamond was saying I think it can be connected to almost almost everything, but I try to bring it in right at um, at the beginning um, about uh, talking about in, indigenous people and then linking that to everybody who's come uh, as migrants as 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 participating within that project. Um, I know that it's really loaded to talk about things like colonialism, capitalism, <laughs> globalization, but those are all all processes that make it necessary to continue to exploit um the the environment for economic gain and that's also a really great um kind of like the framework that diamond was using looking at the economic and political to show that people are being exploited the exact same way that the environment is being exploited 
And that happens regardless if you're in an urban setting um, and you look at particular decisions around green space or looking at rural spaces and, and the fact that farmers are now having a lot harder time um, continuing to do what they're, they're doing. So um, yeah, I, as I said, particularly if you're taking any historical lens, that then the environment is, is right there from the, the start. And then to move forward, because I hate to be all doom and gloom, uh, to also, also talk about um, the connection to a lot of our sense of joy and um, play and um, are often tied to natural spaces. And um, I, I think in the beginning, a lot of us enjoyed doing things outside when we were younger, really because there was a certain sense of kind of freedom. Um, and I, I think we lose that as, as we get older, we start to construct particular spaces as being kind of white spaces and black spaces. And um, I, I think just sort of problematizing that and thinking about our sense of belonging in nature. And to a certain extent that um, the, the pandemic was great in that sense, if there is any plus size to the side to the pandemic is that a lot of people rediscovered um, the simplicity of just simply going outside and, and, and being present and recognizing that a lot of our health um, physically and mentally is connected um, uh, to being in natural spaces. And I think the curriculum, regardless of what discipline you're in, can intersect with, with these sort of, sort of themes. Ashia, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I, have, I have many thoughts about this, so I'm going to try and like condense and keep it, keep it kind of brief. Um, I think at a baseline, um, envir environmental education as a whole, is not considered, um, uh, I'm trying to find the, the right word. Uh, it, it's not considered um, invaluable. It, and it is, it's, it's like, it's, it's critical um, to really understanding. And I think it's a critical piece of education that is throughout, especially like throughout America is just, is just completely disregarded. It's considered an option. It's considered an after school program. It's considered a summer program, which is cool. You know, and I participated in these programs but it's not, you know, it's not institutionalized. And I think that that's very um, purposeful um, because if you learn very early on um, to care about the environment, it's hard to not care about other things afterwards. There's like, a, I think in, in America, especially, it's, it's really important to cultivate a culture of apathy um, and individualism. Um, and that starts at a very early age um, and it starts in the classroom. Um, and where it is done is not done very well, <laughs> like Timon said. Um, and I totally agree with that. Um, so I think at, at a baseline, that's an issue. And then it just gets harder when you're trying to implement um, more justice oriented learning um, or more like, you know, like um, understanding about like how race, how um, sexuality, how class um, influences engagement with, with environment, then it just becomes even, even harder. Um, that's kind of like, I guess, like the, 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 the negative side of things. The positive side is that we do have these programs that are specifically dedicated to developing that sort of like pedagogy, de developing that understanding. And even if they are after school programs or if they are summer programs, that's very valuable. Um, and I think that, you know, expanding those programs is going to be really key in the next couple of years as we are navigating the climate crisis even more. Um, in terms of, you know, implementing more justice oriented learning, um, I think that there is a way to do it well, and then there's a way to not do it very well. If it's considered kind of like an add-on, or if it's considered just like a unit. I remember when I was taking, um, I took an American environmental history class in college, and we spent one day on environment. It was a semester long course. We spent one day on environmental justice. Um, and now like, you know, knowing what I know and looking back, like, Almost, and of course, you know, there's like the environmental justice movement that started in Warren County, and that's usually like a lot of people's like start off point. But I mean, when you start to get into critical environmental justice, 
kind of like what Cheryl was saying, I mean, this entire country was founded on like, uh, like, like, you know, critical environmental injustice um, and climate injustice. Um, and so being able to trace back through history and understand and sit in that discomfort is, is crucial to implementing that. But also, you know, uh, I read a lot of, um, I always pronounce her first name wrong. Um, I think she's Canadian too. Um, uh, Fisile Zumalo, um, she's, uh, she does like elementary school, I can put her name in the chat. Um, she does like elementary school education, but what she does is she does like a lot of kind of like healing um, based learning with young black kids. Um, where we'll like go out, well, they'll go out into nature or they'll go out into a garden and they'll do like observation, they'll like implement like in indigenous techniques of connection. Um, and to me, that's an environmental justice framework too, you know, for students who are oftentimes um, cut off from the land um, or who are, um, uh, you know, uh, racialized at such a young age by their non-Black um, non or, or non-Indigenous teachers. Um, and I think honestly, like a lot of um, the apathy, the um, just like the the um, sadness, uh, the um, the anger really that we see from our youth is part of that environmental estrangement, um, and and you know being able to reconnect in that way um, and really and really rethink the way that we're teaching, especially too. That's not like you know like testing oriented. That's not um, you know like even really with grades. Like in my in my program, we don't we don't do grades. You know, um, we, it's it's about engagement. It's about um, what do you learn? What do you take away? What kind of projects? Um, do you want to implement? How do you want to change your community? Um, being able to empower students in that way, I think, um, is one of the ways that we implement justice too. Amazing. So many good thoughts here. So, you know, Diamond and Cheryl kind of mentioned talking about history. Um, and then you're also talking about um, incorporating some healing into these teachings. I think that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of things are interconnected. And yeah, there is a lot here. And over to um, Alicia finish us off with this question? Yeah, I like like the other panelists, I think that's where my thinking as well too. And I know Ashia, when you were like, yeah, we had a week on EJ, that's essentially every class that I've had has only had a week on EJ. But like, I'm the type of person like, okay, cool. We're gonna talk about labor. We're gonna talk about conservationalism. Like I'm gonna be that person that brings in that thing like, oh, cool. What about environmental racism? How does this impact like communities of color, like I will be that person. Um, but I think it can't be contained to one week. It needs to be drawn out and have I, more classes need to be offered on like environmental racism, environmental justice on themselves. And I think a lot of, at least in like uh, the academy, there's a lot of focus in environmental science programs that focus on natural there needs to be more like embrace of the social aspect of it and I actually did like a couple of facilitations in and I guess taking a step back in order to like incorporate environmental justice and taking like a more critical pedagogical approach is having students have an active role within their learning having them be the teachers which I think is more embraced in graduate schools and graduate programs than in undergrad like having facilitations having grad students lead seminars. Like when I did a facilitation on uh, EJ in my classes, we did like a privilege walk, checking people's like uh, background. How do you kind of, I know we all come up with our own type of privilege and whatever that form that might look like and kind of connecting it to, well, this environmental justice movement, these folks are being impacted by environmental burdens. Why is it? why are folks of color and low income communities being impacted more than like more affluent communities um, and kind of drawing into like the whole history side of it you cannot teach about environmentalism and the environmental movement with also without kind of drawing light to the environmental justice movement this movement was birthed in retrospect to that because these folks not only were fighting for protecting the planet but they also had to take two steps back and fight for basic civil and or civil and social uh, rights. And so for me, it's framing the syllabi for a more critical lens to bring in the voices of the students and kind of connecting it to place. Like if I'm going to teach about like air pollution and climate change, I'm gonna bring in some case studies. You wanna talk about air pollution? I'm gonna talk about the Chevron, Chevron refinery in Richmond. I'm gonna talk about other places that, uh, 
what is it, Cancer Alley in Louisiana. Like I'm gonna draw, uh, make those connections to place. Um, and I also think it's very important. I think community environmental education does a better job at talking about these tough issues than what's happening in the classroom. So bringing in activists, bringing in community leaders to kind of establish this connection to your students, to these topics, and to show that not only learning, or learning doesn't always take place within the classroom, it happens outside of the classroom too, and kind of diminishing those hierarchies. So that's kind of my understanding and contributions. I love that, I love that a lot, this is great. So basically to recap, we're saying that environmental justice you know, in our experiences has always been kind of an, an option or like as an after school program or a club and that we need to have more focus, more specialized classes and programs in environmental justice. We need to decolonize learning, right? And incorporate healing into these teachings, especially for racialized youth, it's super important. We need to acknowledge histories and connect the environment and, and connect that with the environmental movement today. We need to ask the hard hard questions too. You can't teach environmentalist, uh, environmentalism and environmental justice without acknowledging and teaching the civil rights justice movement as well because it's important, it's the root of everything. Case studies, I love that idea of, of using case studies and real examples, bringing environmental leaders and activists into the classroom and um, just changing up the way that you teach in the classroom. It doesn't always have to take place in the classroom. It can take place out on the land. Um, and there's other ways to teach through storytelling um, and through learning about people's experiences. Right on, this is, this is awesome. Thank you for, thank you for that. Nicole, do you wanna lead us with our next question? Yes, I forgot I was co-moderating. <laughs> <laughs> so into it, it's so good. <laughs> I'm tuned in. Um, this is great. Uh, I wish I could have like a course that involved discussions like this because I would have been more present <laughs> yeah. um, and engaged because I, I feel like that, like all of the things you just mentioned are so critical in advancing our, our knowledge about the natural world around us, but also the knowledge of our communities. Like it's so intricate, it's so layered. And just knowing that I could be a part of this conversation with these wonderful panelists, is just, it's so inspiring and it's so like nourishing. Like we're, we're just nourishing each other um, through having these, these important conversations. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I wanna go back to, um, what um, Asia was saying in terms of, am I saying, am I saying your name right? I'm sorry, I just wanna make sure. Ashia. Ashia, sorry. Ashia was saying in terms of things that weren't happening when you were um, in college um, or in school of topics that weren't um, expanded on. And I feel like, this keeps coming back to me because I realized this in college um, when I took a systems thinking class. Um, and this was towards the end of my year of, of uh, getting my bachelor's, but I wish I would have had that in like middle school, high school, even um, systems thinking, because it really helped me understand for myself, like that I was, because I was interested in a bunch of different things that it wasn't weird. <laughs> Like I was that person who's just like, I want to absorb all the information. I love school because I get to learn about a bunch of different things and being exposed to that course, um, systems thinking course made me feel better about wanting to continue to learn about specific things around the environment and not just, you know, hone in on one of those um, and kind of silo myself within a particular field. So I, I'm thinking in terms of what I want to ask, I'm going to try not to overwhelm myself because I'm like, I wish this was like a, a lecture um, where you just have this conversation for like five hours. I don't know if you could sit for five hours, but in terms of continuing on that conver or conversation around what you weren't receiving, like, what do you feel um, like you would have, uh, would have been helpful for you um, starting off in your career as a black environmentalist, but I also wanna connect this to your personal identity of what do you feel like you needed um, within being a black environmentalist, but also to be like a better version of yourself in doing work. So I'm gonna go with Diamond first. <laughs> that is such a hard question. 
because I, I went to college to become a nurse because that was the narrative that my family, you know, doctor, nurse, lawyer, you know, those are successful career paths. And so I went to college to become a nurse, did my first year, realized I did not want to be a nurse and discovered that the environmental industry was a real thing. And I had a fantastic college experience as the only black girl in my program, as the first person of color to graduate with that degree in environmental science from my university. It wasn't until I got into like the working world that, that I felt so different. And, and so it's hard for me to answer because you know everything was great until it wasn't. And I wish, what, what I wish I would have known or, or I was prepared for was to how to have a healthy sense of mental health and what burnout looks like and how to recognize those signs because it was what I was doing, even though I felt so much personal satisfaction out of it, the, the systems that be made it very hard to exist healthily. And I just wish I would have had some heads up about that and had some coping mechanisms to get through that. If I had that connection between healing and the outdoors early on, that would have been really helpful. Um, so, so that's what I wish I would have known. And now, several years later, I'm healing all of that trauma that I experienced trying to, to fit in into these systems and bring my identity to places that weren't prepared to, to accept it, if that makes sense. Yes, it so does. And that's what I think for me learning was because I love school so much, I think that was helping me heal from my own trauma. My own childhood trauma is like having something to connect to that would eventually help me learn more about myself and not even the subjects, but just who I was, who I wanted to be as a, a black woman interested in the environment, environment, but not necessarily tying it to like a career title or like, you know, an academic study, but like, this is me really delving into my interests, my passions, but also understanding myself as a human being of this world and, and how I can um, accept all of those layers of, of knowledge, of emotions, um, of understanding in a way that would carry me through a lifetime and not just for, for school or for a moment. So yes, I, Diamond, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Ashia, if you would like to go next. Yeah, to be perfectly honest, just more people who look like me. Um, honest, I think that really would have like made all the difference. Um, I remember having um, white environmental mentors in undergrad and in grad school too, who could be um, encouraging up until a point, right? Um, and then either their research interests just didn't align or they just didn't have the vocabulary to really like address or think about the things that I was passionate about the, or just didn't have, couldn't even really direct me, you know, like where to go. Um, I, I think that, yeah, that really would have made all the difference, um, which is one of the reasons that I got into education too. I think it's like so valuable for um, young black children, especially to see people who look like them in mentorship positions, um, as scientists, as educators, as storytellers, um, just even like seeing that is so, I, I, I see it, you know, like I, I just see the power in that. And, and that's something that I, I really was craving um, even before I went to college, um, even as like a middle schooler or a high schooler, I didn't have my first black teacher until, there were, there were black teachers like in, in my classroom, but I didn't have my first black teacher until college. Um, and um, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not alone in that, you know, like that's not a unique story. Um, and so just being able to really connect in that way, but also um, I wish that I had known like what was possible a little like kind of like younger on. I remember um, my biology teacher, she's a white woman, like, you know, generally cool lady, very knowledgeable, like super like, you know, like um, it kind of a, Denver hippie environmentalist, you know, like very gung-ho, but I could see even like 
in her, the way that she approached some of her like environmentalism and sustainable practices, it was very like um, carcerally informed. Um, so it's like, well, it makes no sense. Like if people, to, at least to me, it makes no sense to fine people if they are littering. It makes no sense to arrest people if they are loitering. Um, it makes no sense to arrest them um, if they are like, um, you know, like neglecting their animals because there are larger like systemic issues that I think she was just completely ignoring. And it was very much that sort of like individual environmentalist, like this is your fault and you need to be punished for it. Whereas like you can't punish people into making sustainable practices. Like that's just not going to work and it's not going to stick. Like it might work for a short term, um, but then it makes people resent the practice. Um, so really just thinking about how to early on implement these like decolonial approaches. Um, yeah, I wish I had that, which is what I'm trying to pass on now, you know. Yeah, the, the representation is so important. Like, I feel that when you're saying like, just seeing um, it, like it makes you stand a little taller. Like you feel, you feel proud, you feel engaged with, even if you don't know that person, just knowing that they're out there and, and you aren't just the only one is so reassuring and having that representation in, in all of these different areas, um, makes such a difference. So yeah, I totally understand that and, and feeling that. <laughs> and I think about this with environmental education and even just sustainability and climate change and like, you know, things can be fixed if you just recycle. And it's like, <laughs> no, like it's like you were saying, like it's, it's so much more deeper and like you're peeling, you're peeling these layers, right? Of getting to the root of the problem is, is more important than putting a Band-Aid on it and hoping that, you know, people get it. Cause we always have those questions of why don't more, you know, black and brown people do these outdoor nature things. And it's just like, it's such, there's such a disconnect from just asking that question. And it's very triggering <laughs> to just be like, there's this one simple answer. And it's like, no, that's, that's, I think we need to dig deeper in ourselves and be able to sit with that question every single day and not just, okay, let's find a quick solution and it'll all be dealt with. Um, because we, we all have a different role to play within answering that question because there's multiple solutions. There's multiple ways of looking at it, perspectives. Um, so I feel like that definitely, and I feel like, sorry, I'm having these like moments of like insight <laughs> as I'm talking <laughs> of just um, the, again, going back to the, the layers of it. And I feel like the questions that we're still asking or are being asked um, from uh, our white counterparts or institutions that are predominantly white we have the answers from our history. Like they've, it's all been laid out. So I feel like the fact that we're still being asked those questions of you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or like representation or understanding of how do we better engage with these communities is just, it's frustrating. So <laughs> I feel like it's, there's just, centuries of, of answers of, of how we can solve that in, in ways that, you know, um, those things have come to light. And I feel like it just needs to be discussed more, like just openly without it, you know, having to walk on eggshells, but just lay it out there. It's, it's the reality, you know? So um, I appreciate you for, for sharing that. Um, I'll have Cheryl go next if, if you want to add Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of tokenism that's probably happening as well, which is kind of um, what you're speaking to in terms of representation. And I hate to put it all on the, the hand, lay it down and be on EDI work. So equity, diver, diversity, inclusion, it tends to, you know, emphasize the sort of go out and count, get one sort of approach. Um, 
but you know, I've I've done a couple of pieces more recently now where I've looked at say um, the experience of going camping, which wouldn't have been something that my family would have done growing up because they were so taken up with being middle class that why would there be any interest in sitting out on the ground, <laughs> right? There was a particular notion of black civility as professionals and, um, so when I did go uh, camping as an adult, I didn't have any of the skills. So I recognized that there was a kind of form of environmental knowledge that I had been left out of so that my inclination was to think of it as being um, a racial problem, right? So I had to keep checking myself to say, okay, are my feelings of belonging mine? Is there something that's actually going on in this space? that accounts for why I, 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 I don't belong. And I think it ended up being kind of a combination of, of both. So some of my work now is, is thinking a little bit more about um, how it is that people learn particular forms of environmental knowledge. And that's this, the sort of thing that I'm trying to be a little bit more sort of reflexive of to not simply go into a space and, and it's, do the same thing that other people could have been doing of me where they're just sort of saying, oh, okay, well, this is a white space so that we don't need um, black environmentalists. I went into the camping space, looked around for other sort of brown or black people, didn't see any and thought, okay, well, what am I doing here? Um, and to recognize that, you know, belonging in environmental spaces is about knowing to a certain extent what you're supposed to what you should be doing in terms of the roles of the behaviors. And then really I've you know started to advocate as well to recognize that things like um, camping, if I had been, a, you know, for example, a Muslim woman, there's a lot of things in, in that sort of space that would have been really sort of challenging. So um, along with being sort of self-reflexive in my own environmentalism, but to think about it in a broader intersectional lens, always to think, you know, um, what would make these spaces much more um, either engaging or, or challenging for, um, for people with other, other identities and, and why have those spaces remain somewhat fixed in those sorts of ways where um, somebody who needed a little bit more privacy, somebody who needed to prepare their food a particular way may not be drawn to those activities. Um, so those are the sort of things that I sort of think about in terms of my own engagement with environmental spaces. Um, another sort of point that I'm thinking about drawing off of some of the comments is that um, increasingly when I think about environmentalism as well, um, I'm also trying to think about how can we improve our own, our, our own community, so um, Black and racialized communities, and that environmentalism doesn't necessarily preclude good economic development. Um, so I've, I've been really drawn to ideas like um, community benefits agreements as a way for communities, um, particularly since in the city I'm in Toronto, there's constant construction and development going on. And it's the same people who are gaining from it all the time. So knowing what to ask for in terms of environmental goods that communities could be getting and the fact that um, we have a right to actually ask for it if you're gonna be doing construction through our community for the next three years. Um, and I find that those sorts of solutions um, are about positioning um, us as Black folks as, as agents of change that are going to better our own community. And those are the sort of things that I'm really excited about. Thank you, Cheryl. I hear, okay, maybe not. Sorry, if your mic is on, please. <laughs> yourself. Uh, here's some background noise. Sorry, that's, I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Cheryl. I feel like 
Yes, that's what you're saying about this community good um, is, is, I feel like there's a fear in that just because of the marginalized and racialized groups, like understanding that there's fear of like, knowing that you want better and uh, for your community and like understanding that there's a need for that, but then you're being silenced in so many different ways. So you don't want to take that action or that next step to even ask or demand um, better for your community. And I think that definitely needs to change um, because there, er there is effort coming from communities um, to show that, that there's an interest and there's a need um, from community members and community leaders um, and that we don't need saving. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> we don't need saving. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, Alicia, if you want to wrap that up and then we can move on to the next question with Patricia. Yeah, so kind of I get everything. It's like every feeling and things that folks have brought up is what I wish I had to like representation for sure. Like, why do I have to go like ethnic studies is a dope department. I love it so much. But why do I have to go there to have educators that look like me? How come I can't have an environmental studies professor that looks like me? And I didn't have that until graduate school. Like I had dope women of color advisors, but not until I was in my late twenties. Like, why do I have to wait that long to have someone that looks like me? And I also think not only representation physically within the classroom, but also within the curriculum itself. Like I wanna read about the struggles of folks of color, the folks that look like me, not just about but like Charles Darwin and his finches. Like I wanna read about EJ too and be able to establish my own connection. Cause I think that was brought up as well too. Like I love to learn about like new topics and things, but I also, when I'm doing these lessons and reading these books, it's nice to be able to learn about myself too and learn about new aspects about myself as well too. Um, and then the other thing is what I would tell like little Alicia, like imposter syndrome, it's not you. It's the system trying to make you feel this type of way for being the only black person in your environmental science class. Um, they're creating this thing because you are trying not to conform and assimilate with what they think the ideal environment list is supposed to look like. It's not just you. And what I also wish I knew too is about building community, building mentorship. Like the, the teachers you have in the classroom don't have to be your only educators. You can branch out, connect with different mentors that look like you, share the same lived experiences as, with you as well too. Um, as well as early scholar programs. There's, I know Doris Duke, they have folks that um, you can kind of get research experience at a younger age, because I had an inequitable uh, opportunity in like sem senior seminar where I'm being like bashed for being a student of color and just not treated equitably. And so kind of building those communities that, um, and getting that experience within the environmental field alongside folks that look like me. Um, Cause like I had AmeriCorps, there weren't people that looked like me and it felt very isolating. But when I went to the environmental fellows program created by Dr. Dorcita Taylor, like I had people that looked like me, we could share the same experience and I can learn and grow in an environment that I felt comfortable in. Um, so that's kind of what I wish I had growing up. And then I'll also drop the environmental fellows program link if folks want to check out that fellowship for later. All right, thank you so much. So before um, we move on to the um, last question, before we open up for any questions from the audience, please feel free to put your questions in the chat for our panelists. Uh, if you have one, um, maybe hopefully we can get one or two of those in before we wrap up um, at 1.30 Eastern. So just giving a heads up. Thank you so much uh, for being here. If, if more people have come on, I appreciate your uh, viewing. Awesome. This, is, this has been such a great conversation. Um, Diamond, I really love the point that you were bringing up earlier about burnout and wishing that you kind of knew about how to cope at an early age. I think that's that resonates a lot with me and I'm sure a lot of folks on here today just, you know, um, 
you know, being a black woman, um, navigating this field, not seeing other faces that look like me and, you know, just always throwing myself into school and academics and reading and, and wanting to absorb all, all so much and, you know, overextending myself, I feel like, you know, um, and, and, you know, burnout happens and, and not being able to recognize, you know, you know, that until, you know, being an adult and, and learning about burnout and, you know, how to manage your anxiety and maybe take it, not taking on so much, but, you know, when we were younger, just feeling you have to take on so much to maybe prove yourself or, or to be accomplished or to be successful. So that point really st uh, struck me and, you know, um, what everyone was saying, just talking about the lack of representation, you know, the scope is so narrow in, in westernized environmental movement and in these very white institutionalized learning spaces. And, you know, like Nicole was saying, like we need to peel back the layers. There are a lot of systemic issues and it's far more complex than people realize and, and consider. And that's just because it's not taught. Um, you know, uh, and it, yeah, it's, there is a lot there. And so my last question to you all, and, and it's, it's, probably a difficult one, but, you know, considering the fact that Black folks make up maybe 3.5% of environmental science graduates, and there's an even smaller percentage in the workspace, you know, how can we diversify in environmental fields, you know, and I, I, I saw in the chat, you know, Diamond, you had mentioned, like, you, you gave up trying to you try to make space, and so is, what's the answer here? Is it kind of making space for ourselves? Is it, you know, taking on a new approach? Um, uh, carving your own path and doing teaching the way that you want to do it or you know how are we going to get more young black environmentalists or or even more racialized uh voices in general into the environmental fields how can we how can we diversify the environmental fields i guess so whoever would like to take a stab at that big question <laughs> go ahead <laughs> I suppose I could go also because unfortunately I have to uh, run a little bit early before Q&A um, because of work um, more, you know, like environmental education stuff to be done. But um, I know for me, especially, and then kind of just like going off of what Diamond was saying, um, it's one of the reasons why I was so interested in being part of an organization like Mycelium Youth Network, because it really is like grassroots focus. Like the people who are, um, uh, running my silly Youth Network and who like really started it were organizers in the community. They were seeing, they were observing different trends. Um, they knew that uh, certain systemic issues needed to be addressed, but that they weren't getting addressed at that um, academic level or at that state level. And so, you know, it was really kind of like grassroots people who banded together who said, well, what are some ways that we can build climate resilience, um, mitigation and adaptation in our community? Um, and so I think it really does start from the ground up. Um, I, I don't mean to sound like uh, cynical when I say, you know, as someone who like has their master's, as someone who um, was, you know, like briefly in a PhD program, um, I love academia, but I do think that it's an incredibly exploitative relationship um, oftentimes between marginalized people and the academy, um, whether we are in there as students, um, as professors, as postdocs, or if we are, you know, I mean, um, participatory action research has gotten so much more popular, but even that is like kind of like a, like the way that it's getting done is like a, a, more cycles of like the same like colonial um, and extractive process. Um, so it's like, how do we build um, ownership um, in our communities? Um, how do we, you know, like do self-directed research? Um, how do we do, how do we fund, you know, like self-directed initiatives? Um, how do we um, teach people how to organize? How do we teach people how to boycott? Um, I have a particular sense of urgency, especially with like, you know, like the climate crisis we have until 2030. Honestly, I don't even think we have until then. Um, and so there's like a certain level of like urgency that I don't think that diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives are going to, you know, really give us. Um, I think it really does start from the ground up. Um, and, and, you know, I think one thing that like might turn people off of organizing um, is, you know, it's a lot of work. It really is. Um, at some point we have to realize like, what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to sacrifice? Um, how are we, how are we going to show up for each other? You know, especially, I mean, even recently um, with like the Etsy boycott, which isn't even like, you know, like environmentally directed, smaller business owners couldn't participate in the boycott because that's their livelihood. So how do you like build capacity for people to engage in these measures that are eventually going to, you know, like really provide us um, uh, awesome pathways out or awesome pathways for unionizing, for, you know, like um, uh, uh, affecting laws um, and how do you make it possible for people? Um, 
I think is super, super important. Uh, there are like some initiatives that I am like, just like really like mind blown about like um, Leah Pinneman's Soul Fire Farm is like such a cool initiative. Um, there's like a lot of really cool stuff happening in the South with black directed um, energy co-ops. Um, I mean, cooperatives I think are the wave of, are the wave of the future now too. Um, being able to um, share, like again, that sort of like responsibility, that stewardship, being able to share resources um, to facilitate engagement in that way. And yeah, life is going to look a lot different, you know, like if we are starting to like really tap into this decolonial like cooperative process. But in my opinion, it's going to be a lot more rewarding in the long run too. Yeah, absolutely. Those amazing points that you make. Um, yeah, it is really difficult. It's difficult work, um, but it does start with the community. And yeah, I think those are really great points. There's a lot to think on there. Who would like to go next? Alicia? Yeah, so kind of coming at it with a kind of academic lens in terms of diversifying the environmental field. I think it starts like how she was saying from the ground up, but starting within education, getting more kids exposed to the environmental field and what it is and having essentially equitable access because not every student has classes offered to them in environmental science and not only giving them equitable access, but like diversifying the curriculum, like making sure that students can make connections to these environmental topics, not only with like their interest in like trees and plants and all that stuff, but maybe learning about like air pollution and like, oh, that's what that is. That's what that cloud of like smoke and haze is over my, over, over my community. Like I never knew what that was. Like, how do I learn to address this issue? And so going beyond just pertinent environmental topics, but establishing those personal connections and well as bringing in the overall community as well too. Um, I think in terms of, I know the term tokenism was brought up too. Like folks will kind of create band-aid solutions and like, oh, we realize our organization is not diverse. Let's hire a black person and make sure like, oh, we are diverse. We are doing the work. Are you really? Because essentially most of the time with DEI work, it's folks of color doing the work. Like we're gonna hire someone, but we're gonna put a person of color, they're gonna deal with all of that. And I, it's not equitable. Um, so if you are going to hire folks of color, you need to make sure that the support you are giving to your white staff and your white faculty, you are giving that to your your folks of color in those positions as well too. Like if you have a person of color coming up to you like, hey, I had this racist in like incident with this professor, like you're not giving them a slap on the hand, you're actually taking action. And I also would go like beyond um, like per, I would say protecting like folks of color within these roles within this field too. So if you have like a racist incident with between faculty, like not just giving them literature, this is how you become anti-racist, like take action and maybe, I would actually, no, I wouldn't say maybe, I would fire those people. Like you need to change and do the work and not just put a bandaid over it. Um, and I kind of think that goes into like the notion of like decolonize. Cause I, I'm still learning as well too. And I know I fight for like, but everyone should have a seat at the table. They should contribute to this conversation and learning more. And especially Twitter is a great place to learn from people. Like the term decolonize is not about making room at the table. It's about breaking the damn table and rebuilding and restructuring the whole system from the get go. Um, because if you just allow a seat at the table, that whole oppression and all that stuff is just going to continue like a whole new system needs to be rebuilt um but yeah yeah those are amazing points um i yeah i i couldn't agree more i feel like you know just in my experience and and what i've been seeing especially in the environmental field that i work in um, especially over the last couple of years, DEI is just something that's being pushed everywhere. And it's a buzzword, right? Everyone's talking about it and they're getting diverse speakers, but maybe not compensating them or paying them, right? And, and you know, they're trying to do all of this work and, or you, like you said, you know, tokenizing and checking a box. And, you know, I think that 
it's key what you mentioned, like support for racialized staff, you know, make sure and people should be making sure that their workplace is actually safe to welcome diversity before you try to welcome diversity. You know, you can't, you can't check this box, um, you know, before you're actually doing the work. I think that everyone in your organization needs to go through mandatory training and, and, and you know, needs to, to be aware of, of issues that racialized folks face before you start welcoming diversity and also too sharing in that workload, right? And it can be really overwhelming. And oftentimes I feel like a natural reaction is to give that work to, you know, the, you know, the black face or the, the racialized person in your organization. And you're like, oh, you're, you know, you're really passionate about this. Go do that work. But this work's heavy and they need support. And, you know, you know, it, we got to, like you said, restructure, uh, rebuild the whole system because and decolonize it for sure. Um, yeah, I oh, couldn't agree more. She has to go. Bye. Bye. Thank you so no, much for being thank here. Thank you so much for, thank you. for sharing thank you so and much. participating. Yes, likewise. In community. Thank you. Can I, can I add, like, DEI shouldn't be a thing that's, like, DEI, those are three separate things. <laughs> Diversity, <laughs> equity, inclusion. Like, why do we keep lumping it all together as if it's one thing that we're doing when they're very different um and they're presenting presented from different contexts different perspectives and like it's just this thing that's just lumped together and I feel like that's just even more <laughs> disturbing to me that it's just like what are you actually trying to accomplish like it could be you know we need more women we need more um African Americans, Asians, like what are you really trying to say when you say, okay, we're we're wanting to increase our DEI work? Like, mm -hmm. what does that even mean? I, I feel like it would make more sense for um, these institutions to like really just lay it out. Like, don't be afraid. Like, people are still afraid to say black. Like, I yeah, <laughs> I feel like it's just like I don't understand why you can't just be open and real and honest with what you're trying to do. And if you're not understanding or clear of that, just say that, just say, you know what, I don't know what we need. And that's something we need to work towards versus it being because everybody else is doing it. <laughs> yeah, We're just going to yeah. do it too, without having some kind of, um, not even a blueprint, but just the starting steps, like the starting steps of, of what the whole organization or institution needs to work towards. Like you were saying, Patricia, in, in the fact that, um, like the fact that people are volunteering even to do the DEI work of like, oh, that's not something that I need to pay attention to. So like, I'm going to remove myself from that training or like that conversation because I just don't feel like doing it. Like, <laughs> who is yeah. that benefiting? I, I, I don't understand. So I'm just going to stop talking, but <laughs> I totally understand. I totally understand. I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I hear you. It's, it's, mm -hmm. and, and it's also very problematic when we lump things together, right? And I think that people like to lump and group, but, you know, and I find this often, and I talk a lot with my friend Gary, who's Indigenous, and he talks, he's like, you know, we have similar issues, but they're not the same. And when you start lumping DEI work together, you're also lumping in that, like, decolonizing work and all of that. And and, it, and it's, it's, it's taking away from unique experiences and unique issues, right? And, and, and you have to be careful, because it, it is very, it's vastly different. And, and, yeah, it's just, I can go on about this forever, but I, I know we want to get to the open questions. So um, Cheryl, did you want to add to this question? Yeah, I, I'm surprised there isn't sort of greater effort to just sort of partner with, you know, Black organizations, racialized organizations that are already doing the work. Um, th that's another way to sort of support as opposed to um, simply sort of hiring and, you know, just, and a lot of white environmental organizations could, could gain a lot from really just sort of changing the range of the issues that they're doing so that, um, in that sense, what, that their broader mandate and their approach to equity is much more, um, substantive. So I think somebody was talking about how, you know, uh, it's not just wilderness spaces, but there's so much that could be done within cities as well to, to think about um, everything from climate change preparedness to greening spaces and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Diamond, 
I think I don't think you had a chance to answer this question and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. Yeah, I think one of the things that I learned when preparing for Black by Nature programming was trying to meet all of my trainees where they were and meeting their interests. And so I had a, a mixed bag of um, homeschooling moms and nature photographers and recent college uh, uh, graduates and recent high school graduates and getting to know who they were as people since I had the luxury of having a small group and being able to give my time to them. I was able to tailor experiences that spoke to who they were. And in doing so, I think the information that I was able to impart was really deeply received in, in a way that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten for it. So for example, my, uh, my wildlife photographer, we learned mammal tracking and we learned about animal behavior in, in urban areas. And he was able to take that information and track coyote to get a first picture of a coyote in Baltimore City. And so making it make sense for the people that you're trying to reach, I think is really important as an environmental educator with, with that lens on to, to trying to diversify the field. And since that has ended, more than a couple of them have gone on and gotten jobs in the field without even me knowing and without me having anything to do with it. But because I gave them some perspective, I gave them some ways to integrate the knowledge in a way that felt good to them, they were able to take and, take and run with it. I love that meeting people where they're at. I, I think that, yeah, I think that's huge. I think that is very important and is often forgotten. And I think, you know, especially just coming from, you know, um, more structured workplaces and work settings too, you know, like the ability to be flexible, like you said, you know, working with people, you know, that are maybe single moms, right, or, or people on different schedules, you know, I think, you know, it is really important to have some flexibility and um, to your structure and even to your timing to be able to accommodate for more people and to make people feel comfortable. And again, meeting them where they're at. I think that's great. Well, these are, this is awesome. This is such a great discussion. I, Do we I love this. Oh, I was going to say in terms of what um, you and Diamond were saying, like there are some moms out there doing experiments for the betterment of their children. <laughs> like they're scientists. I'm sorry, I'm shouting, but like, <laughs> like there's amazing people in our community that are doing such amazing work that don't get recognized or amplified. And I count mothers as, <laughs> as people like, they know what, what they need, they know what their children need and like embracing that and accepting that as part of this knowledge building that we're doing is like so critical. So yeah. the, the people out there who are the creatives, who are the um, storytellers, the, the people that are bringing the information um, to the masses in a way that's under, understandable, and that's engaging and that's uplifting. Oh my goodness. Like I would love to see more of that embraced and, and normalized in a way that um, you don't have to feel isolated in your interests. Like, and even what you're thinking about, like it could just even be ideas, but like to not be able to share those ideas with your community for fear of being um, judged or criticized um, is just, it's disheartening. So um, again, I'm just gonna stop talking because <laughs> all the great things <laughs> this is amazing conversations we're having um i did want to open it up because we have a few minutes for kind of open questions so people who have tuned in today please ask us your questions in the chat and we will try to get the, as many of them answered as possible okay so we have a question here um from and i'm so sorry if i mispronounce your name desi uh, thank you for all your amazing work. The time you took in sharing your perspectives and valuable knowledge is greatly appreciated. My question is, I wonder if any ideas about connecting our African environmental educators to the African people and, Afri and African run institutions world worldwide. Oh, if there's any ideas about connecting African environmental educators to the African people and African run institutions worldwide. That's a good question. It's a good question. Anyone have any thoughts on that? I have a very like anecdotal 
thought about that and that social media is such a powerful thing and that I have been able to connect with environmental educators from around the world just by being on social media and making content that's, you know, that speaks to the things that I do and that I'm interested in. In fact, um, my internet brother, uh, Anthony, (laughs) he's from Kenya and he sent me a message the other day and said that he would be in the DMV and wanted to meet. Unfortunately, I'm here in Mexico. Up out there, being on social media, networking in person and online are definite ways to connect with um, our brothers and sisters uh, on the motherland. Yeah, that's that's really good, especially over the last couple of years. I feel like connecting, I've made a lot of connections online and through social media because that was what's been available. And so being able to chat with other folks doing awesome work in other places is it's yeah, it's amazing. It's a good tool. Social media can be a bad tool sometimes, but it has been a very positive tool in connecting communities, I think. Does anyone else have any other thoughts for that? We have a couple more minutes before we have to wrap up. I think kind of going off of what Diamond is saying too, um, not only social media, but uh, within like the academic, as well as like out non-academic too, there's conferences. I went to a conference, I believe it's called Black in Nature. I can try to find it and share the link too. Um, but we had not only there was like um, panels of folks from all over the world. Like I got to learn from um, environmental educators that were black working, doing work within like the United Kingdom and all other parts of the world. So kind of attending these conferences and attending the networking opportunities to to speak with further with these um, these speakers as well too. Um, and then also not only making those connections, um, but kind of if you're within the classroom, bringing that voice into the classroom as well too. Uh, yeah, yes, I will, when the next person shares, I'll try to do some searching and try to find it. But yeah, um, definitely conferences and networking. Absolutely. Cheryl? Um, I would say that there's also the opportunity, clearly, and I think this is what was being suggested by the other comments, for us to learn from what's going on in in Africa, a lot of African nations. They are um, at the forefront um, of dealing with um, issues like renewable energy and how to um, uh, you know, deal with, with solar and how to uh, storage issues and um, that type of, uh, of science. It's just that we don't hear about it um, that much. I, I like to sort of envision a kind of futuristic, almost Black Panther sort of uh, <laughs> arrangement where um, there are um, incredibly well-known sci- African scientists that have been um, dealing with these issues mainly because they have to, and um, issues of uh, scarcity are, are is is greater there. Um, so the yeah, the information needs to be going sort of um, both both ways, and the fact that we tend to sort of privilege uh, Western. Western perspectives is a uh, is that that same colonial bias that we've been talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a good point. We don't often, especially I, I feel like in a from a Westernized lens, you know, in in Canada, the United States, we don't often look to other countries to seeing what they're doing. And there's so many cool advancements that are being made um, that if we just took a second to to learn from and try to adapt some of these practices here, I think we would be so much further along um, than we are, unfortunately. And we maybe wouldn't be in some having some of the issues that we are having, which is unfortunate. So yeah, that's a very good point. Any last questions? We have two minutes left and then it, we're, it's a wrap for, for today's Zoom meeting. Any other final questions? Also, I just want to remind everyone to please complete our survey for hashtag Black and Environ Week or for our events. Um, you have an opportunity to win, uh, to, to win, um, or your, sorry, your name will be entered into a raffle to win a copy of Fresh Banana Leaves by Dr. Jessica Hernandez. So definitely fill out the surveys, give us some feedback, please. We wanna hear from you. 
Yes, and please remember uh, that we still have stuff going on today. So tune in uh, for our Twitter space that's happening, I believe with TJ, um, that focuses on this conversation around um, Black to School and environmental education. So stay tuned for that at seven um, on Twitter. I'm looking forward to that conversation in that panel. And then um, again, making sure that um, you share, uh, follow all of that stuff with Black and Environment uh, so we can continue continue to amplify and highlight um, your work as well, because I know that, again, there's amazing people out there doing wonderful things. Um, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you for co-moderating with me, Tricia. You've been wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and thank all of our panelists, Alicia, um, Cheryl, Diamond, and um, Ashia, who had to leave early, but this was such an amazing and, and nourishing conversation. I've learned so much. I'm going to go back and watch a million and one times and take notes. Um, because we need to have more of these conversations because um, it's it's a part of our, our lived experiences and it's a part of our, our daily work and it needs to continue. So thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. This is very inspiring and we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for moderating. It was great to be in conversation.